Thank you very much for the for the introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be invited to give this uh, keynote lecture. And it's really um, a pity that I cannot be there with you, uh, but I hope that you will enjoy this uh, presentation and I will anyway be available to, to answer questions at the end. So this, um, this work is on explain and controlling turbulent flows through deep learning. Uh, this is research funded by the, by the ERC, the European Research Council. And I would like to um, start by acknowledging some of my collaborators and contributors uh, who have really uh, made this possible. Uh, these are all, only some of my of my closest collaborators. There are many more uh, students, uh, postdocs, uh, researchers, and, and friends uh, who have really made all of this all of this possible. Also, uh, we can motivate a little bit the work that I'm going to be talking about today um, by looking at a, at a typical airliner. This is an Airbus um, A320. Uh, if we look at the different contributors um, to a total drag, what we see is that about 50% of the drag comes from friction. So that's uh, turbulent boundary layers. Uh, and in particular, uh, the boundary layers developing around the curved surfaces uh, on the different parts of the, of the airplane. Uh, and about 40% of the total drag comes from the lift induced component, which happens uh, at the wing tips. So basically due to the difference between uh, uh, the pressure and the suction side, you have these wind tip vortices, which I will be mentioning uh, briefly uh, later in the presentation. So if we look at turbulent bound layers uh, with pressure gradients, we can understand more or less 50% of the total drag. Uh, and then this additional 40% comes from these uh, wind tip vortices, which are actually uh, quite uh, quite important as well. So what am I going to be talking about today? Uh, I'm going to talk about three different things. Um, and of course, I want to relate um, the topics that I'm interested in, which has to do with uh, high performance computing and turbulence on the one hand, and on the other hand, also uh, machine learning and data-driven methods that can be coupled with, this, um, uh, with these challenges that we want to be looking at. So in the first part, I'm going to be um, talking about our work over the past years on high fidelity simulations, uh, mostly DNS or uh, slightly coarser DNS uh, on pressure gradient bound layers and wings. Uh, we have produced uh, a lot of very good uh, and high quality data. Uh, then on the second part, I'm gonna be talking about uh, how to analyze that data using explainable deep learning and how we can really learn something new about coherent structures in turbulence uh, with this uh, technology, with explainability. And finally, uh, the part that is a bit uh, more uh, computationally involved in the sense that we had to uh, couple uh, different machine learning libraries and different CFD codes, uh, which kind of connects a bit with the main uh, interests also of this conference. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, deep reinforcement learning for flow control uh, in the context of turbulence. So let's start with um, the first part. Let's start by talking uh, about uh, high fidelity simulations. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is actually a DNS. This is a fully resolved uh, direct numerical simulation of the turbulent flow around an ACA 4412 wind section, Dynos number 400,000 and angle of attack five degrees. This simulation was carried out quite some years ago now. You can see the reference um, to all the data and statistics uh, in this reference in 2017. What you can see here are basically uh, vortex clusters colored by streamers velocity, and we are flying around the wing. So close to the train edge, you can see a region of incipient separation. The flow is actually attached uh, on the mean, but there is more than 30% backflow. You can see now how the boundary layer on the section side is uh, significantly thicker than the one on the pressure side, and the, there is much more uh, large scale energy in the outer region due to the effect of the adverse pressure gradient. There is an adverse pressure gradient on the section side, which produces these effects. Uh, and now we're flying on the pressure side, that's the bottom surface of the wing, where you can actually see how these um, vertical motions uh, look different because they're subjected to a mild favorable pressure gradient, which basically attenuates some of the energy transfer mechanisms uh, in the boundary layer. You can also see now the level of detail that we can achieve on the wake um, and, and basically the typical uh, von Karman type of uh, shedding uh, in the wake of the of the wing. So this is just an example. And again, the simulation is a few years old. I will be showing something more recent uh, soon, but just to illustrate the type of high quality data that we can produce nowadays. And of course, uh, we want to understand a bit what happens on the top of the wing, on the section side. Uh, 
and that's basically uh, exposed to a quite strong average pressure gradient. Um, at the top, you have a flat plate boundary layer where uh, essentially as the stream wise distance increases, the boundary layer develops. And we have progressively a higher Reynolds number uh, with more and more energetic motions in the outer region uh, when there is a zero pressure gradient. So there is no acceleration or deceleration of the flow. So the free stream velocity is constant. But on the bottom panel, I'm showing you what happens when you have an adverse pressure gradient. So basically the pressure is increasing as I move downstream, which means that um, effectively the wall normal velocity is increased. Yeah? So we are just uh, having much more convection in the vertical direction. This leads to a significant thickening of the boundary layer uh, and also to uh, two interesting effects. <clears throat> First, we have um, migration of some of the small scale energy uh, close to the wall uh, towards the outer region due to that uh, increased wall normal velocity and then you have also more energetic uh, scales in the outer region due to the increased uh, production there and, and that's uh, due to the different shear uh, which then couples with different Reynolds stresses uh, basically leading to more local production of um, of turbulent kinetic energy in that outer region. Now, to give you an idea, on the right, I'm showing you in blue the wall normal velocity of a zero pressure gradient boundary layer, and in red of an adverse pressure gradient with a moderate um, pressure gradient intensity. Uh, and the, the value of the wall normal velocity close to the boundary layer edge is about four times larger in the case of the adverse pressure gradient, the APG. So APG effects are closely connected with this um, with this uh, wall normal convection, with this vertical velocity that I was mentioning. Now, something that we were very interested in uh, was a uh, flow history, right? Because of course, this pressure gradient magnitude changes and you have different wind geometries and different the fuselage and you have the uh, all these, all these uh, components of the aircraft that are gonna have different geometries. They're gonna uh, basically introduce different flow history effects, different pressure gradient evolutions. So we're looking at this quantity, beta. This is uh, the so-called uh, Rota-Clauser pressure gradient parameter. Is basically the displacement thickness over the wall shear stress times the stream-wise pressure gradient. Um, and what I'm showing you here in the big figure is uh, in the vertical axis beta, which is the, the pressure gradient um, parameter, the rota clauser pressure gradient parameter, and in the horizontal axis, the friction Reynolds number. This is work, uh, by the way, carried out by Alexandra Bocke quite some years ago also, but uh, still relevant today and perhaps even more relevant due to the new findings that we're having with uh, history effects. Um, the different colors are different uh, cases, different simulations. Um, in red, I'm showing you the wing that I just uh, illustrated with the video. Uh, in the wing, the pressure gradient uh, parameter increases very, very quickly, right? So you really reach very, very high values uh, close to the train edge of the wing. And the friction Reynolds number at some point starts to decrease. And this is because the average pressure gradient increases the thickness of the boundary layer, but it also reduces the, the friction significantly. So at some point, the reduction in friction is so pronounced that the trend in, in Aritao, in the friction Reynolds number, goes down. Now, the rest of cases are pressure and boundary layers on flat plates with different evolutions of the free stream velocity, which basically are leading to different evolutions of beta. Uh, all of these are in near equilibrium, which means that the outer region is still similar, and we have an evolution of the um, free stream velocity following a power law. Um, the orange line gives you a constant beta of one, and the brown line a constant beta of two. The other cases have a variable beta, although they are still in near equilibrium. Now, why is it interesting to have constant beta cases? This is because uh, they allow us to define somehow a canonical APG conditions in the same way that the zero pressure gradient boundary layer is a widely studied case and it's a particular um, case of constant beta boundary layer where beta is equal to zero. So when you have a constant beta of zero, you have a zero pressure gradient case, constant beta of one, two, et cetera. Those are uh, more general APG cases still with constant beta. And constant beta cases allow us to separate on the one hand uh, pressure gradient effects and on the other uh, flow history effects. So <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is what happens when we try to match the local pressure gradient and Reynolds number conditions. Yeah? So here in point number two, uh, you can see uh, how the red line and the purple line intersect. Uh, they have the same Reynolds number and the same beta, 
uh, but different flow histories, right? The, the red line comes from very small values of beta, which increase very quickly. And the purple line uh, basically is, is a boundary that has been exposed to a strong pressure gradient for quite some history-wide development. At the bottom uh, left panel, I'm showing you uh, the inner scale mean velocity profile um, as a function of the wall normal coordinate, which is in the horizontal axis. Um, the colors correspond to the cases uh, in the top right panel. And in black, I'm showing you the zero pressure gradient boundary layer uh, at the same Arita uh, for reference. So one uh, very, uh, very, let's say, a prominent effect of the APG on the mean flow is the increase of the wake uh, region. So basically, uh, in, the, in the final part of the boundary layer, where the velocity reaches kind of constant, not necessarily completely constant, but kind of constant value. Um, that's the, the inner scale free stream velocity. Uh, that's a larger value in APGs than in CFPGs. And that's because you have less friction. So you have less friction, and this is a scale with the friction velocity, that wake becomes more prominent. And though both uh, APGs exhibit a more prominent uh, wake, which is uh, as we expect, but the purple line exhibits an even more prominent wake which is something kind of interesting because the local friction Reynolds number and pressure gradient uh, is the same in both cases. If we look at the red panel, <laughs> what we have is um, in black, the zero pressure gradient case. Um, and another important effect of uh, pressure gradient effects of APG effects is an increase of both the inner and outer peaks of the stream-wise velocity fluctuations, which you can see here, these are the Reynolds stresses, um, and the effect uh, of the, of the flow history, as you can see, is more pronounced in the purple case, because even if both the red and the purple uh, profiles have a quite a strong outer peak, uh, the purple line um, has a much stronger outer peak than the red one, which indicates that uh, that boundary layer has been exposed to a much stronger APG uh, evolution, which means that the accumulated effect is more prominent. Uh, it's interesting because in the, ne in the near wall uh, region, the peak is the same in both cases, which uh, suggests that small scales react more quickly to the uh, changes in pressure gradient, whereas uh, large scales react more slowly and they're more uh, exposed and more uh, sensitive to the upstream evolution of the pressure gradient. So this is a little bit um, what we can uh, basically show as evidence that uh, flow history is important. It's not about the local pressure gradient or the local Reynolds number, but the upstream evolution of these quantities. Um, and if we look at uh, point number three, uh, what we can see is that the blue line has been exposed to a slightly different evolution from the brown line, but for quite some, uh, for the final evolution of the domain, the two lines are actually very close. In fact, for seven boundary layer thicknesses, they are uh, both quite close. It shows that um, if we look at the statistics, uh, they actually match quite well, the blue and the brown lines, and that shows that um, it's actually possible to converge to a sort of canonical uh, APG state, in this case with beta 2, uh, even if the upstream history is a bit different, as long as you maintain, for quite some stream-wise development, uh, the same flow history, the same pressure and conditions. Again, these are simulations uh, carried out with... Uh, with uh, in this particular, in this case, it was a fourier chebyshev code, um, quite large computations, uh, and this is uh, almost DNS solution, so quite well resolved. How can we really use this uh, knowledge that we are gaining about uh, flow history and different flow cases and evolutions? Well, this is one um, empirical result, an empirical correlation that we developed also some years ago. You can see the reference at the bottom. Um, what we are doing here is uh, predicting the skin friction curve from any pressure gradient case based on the skin friction curve from zero pressure gradient boundary layers and the shape factor from zero pressure gradient boundary layers. And both uh, the skin friction and the shape factor for set PGs, they have very well known um, correlations. So we can actually use those correlations as our baseline, and then we can correct with the pressure gradient to try to go to the right um, APG uh, case. And um, in our case, we use this uh, beta uh, average, which you can see defined here, <clears throat> as a way to encapsulate the upstream history of the um, of the layer. 
So this beta average is just an integral of beta with ari theta, with the momentum thickness space Reynolds number. And what you can see on the left in these lines is the skin friction as a function of the momentum thickness space Reynolds number for the various cases where black is the ZPG, red is the wing, and in between you have the rest of um, APGs. And on the right, uh, the symbols are the uh, predictions of the skin friction based on this uh, empirical formula, which, as you can see, it's actually uh, giving us quite good uh, agreement. So, of course, this is just an empirical correlation. One can probably improve and try to get something more sophisticated for more complex cases. But even in the wing, where the um, history is actually quite non-trivial, no? with quite a complex exponential increase, uh, the predictions are, in fact, uh, really good. So this is something to maybe inspire more work on uh, being able to assess history effects more effectively. Something that we're also quite interested in is uh, the spectra. So really being able to understand the energetic distribution across the scales. Uh, this is work by Ramon Pozuelo, which we published in JFM a couple of years ago. This is now um, a flat plate boundary layer with a constant beta of 1.4, but a much higher Reynolds number. This is a tau of 2000. So this is actually uh, already a quite uh, a quite pronounced uh, scale separation, which allows us to really pinpoint and assess flow history effects. Uh, what I'm showing you here in the vertical axis is the inner scale wall normal coordinate, and in the horizontal axis the inner scale span-wise wavelength. So this is the power spectral density uh, in in Z for each wall normal location. In black, I'm showing you the spectrum of the zero pressure gradient boundary layer, and in orange, uh, the spectrum, the inner scale uh, pre-multiplied power spectral density um, in the streamwise direction for the APG. And of course, the near world region is similar, uh, but there are two main differences. The first one is this kind of shoulder that you can see here. This is a small scale energy in the outer region, uh, which basically comes from the wall normal convection that I was talking about before. And the second difference is the outer uh, spectral peak, which is also more uh, intense in the case of the APG, again, due to the different shear, uh, which then produces a, a different production and different production stresses. So uh, APGs are fundamentally different from ZPGs, uh, at least uh, in this Reynolds number range. We know also that at higher Reynolds numbers, the APG effects are less intense. So there is a certain... Um, exploration to be done with a higher Reynolds number regime. But at the moment, this is the this is everything we know, basically. And I promise you that I will talk about the, um, the lift induced um, the lift induced drag. So this is another um, very recent simulation. This is uh, by Siavas Tosi, um, who was a senior researcher in my group. This is to appear in JFM. Um, and you can see a wind tip. Right? So this is really a wind that is not periodic anymore. It has a rounded wind tip. This is a simulation with um, a spectral code uh, NEC 5000 based on spectral element methods. Uh, this has also adaptive mesh refinement. And uh, you can see here uh, also the vortex clusters identified with the lambda 2 criterion and color by stream mass velocity. Um, this is about 1.6 billion grid points. Uh, we have a number of cases. So this is a Reynolds number of 200,000 with five degree angle of attack, but we have cases at zero, five and 10 degrees. And we have the corresponding periodic cases as well. So we can compare um, the aerodynamic uh, effect of the windy vortex. You can actually see the windy vortex here quite well and how it essentially pushes down the wake due to the induced rotation that it has. So uh, th through that rotation, the wake gets pushed down in such a way that the ability of the wing to extract lift from the flow gets diminished. So you need to increase the angle of attack to get the same lift. And that adds an additional component to the drive. So that's the lift induced component. Here you can see in a very high level of detail how the wind tip vortex is rolling from the pressure to the suction side. You have a region of um, uh, local relaminarization due to the strong span waste pressure gradient that we are uh, introducing with this wind tip vortex. And you can also see how it really impacts the, the turbulent boundary layers. Uh, on, the, on the section side and the pressure side. This region of uh, inhibited turbulence or kind of laminarization, it uh, feeds them the wake, which is also quite affected by, this, um, by these changes over here. So basically, um, this is a state-of-the-art simulation um, where we can really, again, uh, produce very high-quality data 
with the possibility of um, then analyzing uh, this in detail and maybe uh, leveraging some of our uh, machine learning models to try to, to learn something about it. So what can we learn? Now that we, that we talked about the quality of the data, I want to uh, look at how we can analyze the data. And to analyze it, the first question that I'm always asking is, um, what are the most important regions of the flow? What should I be looking at? This is important from the perspective of sensing the flow, but also from the perspective of controlling the flow. Uh, and this is a question that, on the one hand, uh, Elcirana Jimenez uh, looked at um, using what is called an intrusive method. So they were basically taking DNS of homogeneous isotropic turbulence. They were introducing different perturbations in that uh, DNS, and then they were rerunning the, the DNS uh, to see which of those perturbations were growing the most. And then uh, in that way, they could really assess that strain-dominated vortex clusters were the most important uh, regions, basically. Now, an alternative approach um, was taken by Lozano Duran and Arranz, um, which is based on information theory uh, and, and causality. Uh, in this uh, method, uh, which is non-intrusive, that means that you're not modifying the flow, uh, you need time series, which you can obtain from model decomposition. And then essentially what they do is that they remove the uh, evolution of one of these time series to see how that affects the future predictions of the rest of time series in such a way that you can really assess its um, the, the mutual uh, causality relations among those. Um, and of course, the, the advantage of it being non-intrusive is that you don't change the flow, but you need quite some data to converge this, this time series no, in terms of causality. So what we propose is a method based on deep learning, um, which is intrusive in a surrogate model. Yeah? So we uh, change the flow, but we change it in a post-processing way, in a well, in that surrogate uh, manner, right? Um, this has one advantage, and is that it can be applied uh, in contexts where, the, where there is not so much data, like experiments. So you don't need to run DNSs; you can do it with experimental data. And we uh, showed the feasibility of this uh, method based on deep learning uh, on a turbulent channel at a low Reynolds number uh, with 6,000 three-dimensional snapshots. And we start by looking at uh, intense Q events. The intense Q events are uh, defined by this uh, equation that I'm showing you here. These are basically three-dimensional regions of um, high values of the stringwise and wall normal velocity fluctuations so these uh, instantaneous values of the fluctuations need to be higher than the RMS of U and the RMS of V multiplied by some function H, which is a hyperbolic hole uh, threshold. And this function H is um, decided uh, such that we can maximize the number of extractors. And so at the end, we're just looking at three-dimensional volumes of intense Reynolds series stress. And this uh, work was developed by Andres Cremades, who is a postdoc in my group. This was published in Nature Communications earlier this year. Um, so all the codes and all the data are available online. So you can just, and also, by the way, about the um, data sets that I talked about before, all the data is online. So you can just go to the uh, web of my lab and then you can find everything there. Um, the, the method based on explainable deep learning has three steps. The first step, we use um, a three-dimensional unit, which is a computer vision tool, to predict, given the current state of the flow, the future state of the flow. Then we segment the uh, input uh, field, uh, and we look at the Q events there. And then what we do is that we start to remove Q events to really see how the future evolution of this flow field changes. And in such a way that we can uh, well, try to look at what uh, of those Q events have more importance towards the predictions of the flow fields. And I'll give you more details in just a second. But uh, to kind of uh, understand a bit more the method, we are using these units that I mentioned before. These units are uh, basically three-dimensional convolutional neural networks. So these are deep learning methods. Um, the convolutions are very good because they allow us to exploit a spatial patterns in the data. And of course, turbulence, as you can judge by the videos that I showed you before, um, it's basically relying on and is composed by a quite localized spatial information, these coherent motions. No? So, so there is a lot of spatial patterns to be exploited uh, through convolution filters to be able to improve our predictions. Uh, our input is going to be uh, comprising three three-dimensional flow fields. So the three-dimensional flow fields of the U, B, and W fluctuations in the current step. 
And the output is, again, the three three-dimensional flow fields of U, V, and W in a future step. And uh, how far away are these input and output fields? Uh, the results that we're going to be show, showing today are about uh, five viscous times separation between both, but the results don't change between one to 10 viscous times. They're basically the same. Now, what I'm showing you at the bottom is a schematic representation of a, of a unit. So you start with your input, you apply a series of convolutions, then after a while, you are um, reducing the resolution with a max pooling layer. So now the fields are coarser. You apply more convolutions, you uh, perform another max pooling layer to reduce the resolution once again, you apply more convolutions, then you do a, um, a transpose convolution to go up in resolution for a bit, apply more convolutions, and then a transpose convolution to again recover the original resolution and finally complete some uh, additional convolution features. Now, the name of this network is the UNET comes from this U shape, so not so original perhaps. You start with very high resolution and you lower the resolution for a while, then you recover the original resolution. Perhaps one key feature here is this green arrow that you can uh, see at the top. This green arrow is connecting feature maps from early in the network, so kind of abstract and perhaps simpler features, and more um, those, feature, those feature maps are connected with feature maps at the end of the network, which are much more uh, relying on more uh, complicated um, features from the, from the flow. So it's been shown in computer vision that such combination of feature maps from simpler and complex uh, elements really increases the, the performance of our neural networks. And um, this green arrow, this is something called a skip connection, eh, or basically a residual block that we are having. So this is a, a quite powerful tool in computer vision. And actually, this method allows us to obtain pretty good predictions. So we're predicting, predicting the flow field with only 2% relative error. Um, which, again, nowadays we have even better models with less than 1% error, but 2% error uh, is, is pretty good. I mean, as you can see here, by looking at the streaks in the near world region, the first row is the DNS, the second one is the unit prediction, first column is the lower wall, and the upper column is the, is the upper wall. Um, so the right column is the upper wall. You can see that the streaks are very well represented. The streaks are uh, in very good agreement. The statistics, the spectra, everything is actually pretty, pretty good. So this is a, a, a good surrogate model to play our game of removing extractors and see what happens. And this is what the method looks like. <clears throat> so what we do is that we have our true input field. Okay. Now, what we do is that we are going to use this input field um, with a unit to perform our prediction that will give us a predictive flow field. And that predictive flow field is going to be compared with the, with the ground truth, with the DNS flow field, and there will be an error, right? The one from the neural network and the one from the DNS will be about 2% error, something like that. Now what I do with my input is that I'm going to remove extractors. I'm going to remove extractor. I'm going to repeat the prediction, which means that I will have another predictive flow field, which I will compare with the DNS, and I will recalculate the error. And then doing that for all the structures, we will come up with a ranking uh, of how much each of the structures has affected the prediction error that we are getting. And that uh, ranking uh, is based on what we call the sharp values or the importance scores. So those are really the elements that allow us to assess the importance of each of the, of the structures. And the idea as you can see here, um, is that we can use a, a linear model G for the error between the neural network and the ground truth. And this linear error comprises this uh, Q1, Q2, Qn variables. These are binary variables indicating presence or absence of each of the extractors. And this phi1, phi2, phi n, these are uh, weighting factors in this linear function, um, which uh, essentially indicate um, the relative weight of that structure towards the error, right? So these are the, the sharp values. These are actually the importance scores. Uh, the sharp values are calculated through a mean square um, minimization, right? So we just want to minimize the difference between the true error F and the linear model of the error G. Um, and when that difference is minimized, then we can actually obtain the, 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 the sharp values, essentially. Now, uh, there are two assumptions here, right? The first one is that we're using a linear model for the error. The question is, is that a, a fair assessment in a nonlinear chaotic flow? 
And the, the reality is that the difference between F and G squared, so between the, the real error and the linear model of the error, is of order 10 to the minus 7, where the fluctuations are of order 1. Which means that, um, in principle, um, we have so many extractors that even if uh, we look only at the at the leading contribution to the error, we don't look at cross-structure interactions to that error, um, it still is, is enough, it's accurate enough. So that's, in principle, uh, good. And the second assumption is that we are looking at structures one by one uh, in a case that is, again, chaotic, nonlinear, and, and complex, right? Um, is that representative of the physics? Well, the reality is a little bit more complicated because when we remove extractors, we remove them in so-called coalitions. And these coalitions are groups of extractors where um, I can uh, basically remove uh, and assess the effect of one extractor in different roles. Some of these coalitions include near wall um, elements. Some of the others include outer flow elements. Um, so the role of each extractor is assessed in different contexts. And we have really tested uh, thoroughly uh, the hyperparameters here in terms of how many extractors per coalition, how many coalitions, uh, in such a way that these results are quite robust. So in principle, uh, these two are assumptions that are required from a computational point of view, because uh, this problem is uh, intractable to, to really look at all the possible combinations. But uh, this this gives us confidence that we are having quite uh, converts and, and, and robust results. Uh, and this is also backed up by the, um, by the computer vision community, uh, which has uh, also extensively used this type of methodology. So let's look at some results. Um, in the vertical axis, I'm showing you the shaft value, so the importance. In the horizontal axis, I'm showing you the volume of the structures, and this is the joint PDF. So basically, the, the joint probability density function of importance and size. And in principle, uh, what we can see here is a pretty good correlation. No? So large structures are more important, which makes sense. And dividing them into the four quadrants, the more important ones in turbulence are the blue ones, uh, ejections, uh, and the yellow ones, which are sweeps. No? Ejections is flow going up and sweeps is flow going down, essentially. Uh, what happens if I scale this per unit volume, right? So now in the vertical axis, I'm showing you the importance per unit volume and in the horizontal axis, the, the volume of the structures. And now that correlation is gone. So the largest things which are in this blue balloon are not the most important anymore. The most important things are in that red um, area over here, which are essentially medium-sized ejections. Yeah? So, so the classical intuition is maybe not fully correct when we look at things per unit volume. What happens with the Reynolds stress? Because of course, uh, we're looking at Q events. These are regions of intense Reynolds shear stress. And as we can see here, when I represent the importance as a function of the Reynolds shear stress, there is again a pretty good correlation. So naturally, the structures with highest Reynolds shear stress are also more important. But if I look at the importance per unit volume in the vertical axis, as a function of the Reynolds shear stress per unit volume in the horizontal axis, we get something quite interesting. We get three different regions. And in region A, the correlation is gone. So for the same Reynolds shear stress, there is a quite broad range of importances. Okay? In region B, I'm having the structures with the highest Reynolds shear stress. And in region C, the structures with the highest importance. And when we look at things per unit volume, the uh, traditional uh, intuition is kind of gone. Now, the elements, the structures with the highest Reynolds shear stress, they're not the most important anymore. There's something else. This is something that uh, helps us when we are looking at things um, with a more objective definition of importance, right? Because the Reynolds shear stress uh, is something that, uh, well, you know, we can see in the mean momentum equation, and obviously it needs to have some relevance. Uh, but at the same time, uh, in this way, we are objectively defining regions of importance. Now, we wanted to uh, corroborate this experimentally because I told you at the beginning that this can be used for experiments. So then we interacted with Ivan Manusik's group in the University of Melbourne. Um, and then we uh, wanted to do experiments because first of all, when you do um, experiments, typically you have higher Reynolds numbers than in the DNS. So perhaps the most important things at low and higher Reynolds numbers are different. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another reason to do this method on the experiment is because in experiments, you typically have less access to data. You don't have nicely to resolve 3D things. You have, if you're lucky, 2D PIB uh, data, 
uh, which might uh, lack some information and some resolution. So the question is not what are the most important regions of the flow, but from whatever I can measure, what is the most important? That's the actual question that I want to answer. And in the database from uh, Ivan Marusek's group, uh, this is a towing tank experiment, so a boundary layer that grows in time. Uh, we have, again, 6,000 snapshots, two-dimensional flow fields, time resolve, and the Reynolds number, the friction Reynolds number is over 1,000. So an order of magnitude higher than in the DNS. Okay. What I'm showing you on the left is, as before, the importance as a function of the volume and the correlation is still there. So it's a pretty good correlation, like in the DNS. The yellow um, region has become more uh, important, and that's uh, that means that the sweeps are starting to become progressively more important. That is expected at higher than those numbers, so that's very well known. On the right, I'm showing you the importance per unit volume as a function of the, well, actually, I should say the surface, because these, uh, these are 2D planes now, so we're looking at the surface of the structures. So the importance per unit surface as a function of the surface. Again, the largest things are not the most important, is in this red balloon where medium-sized ejections are present, where we have the most important elements. And the same happens with the Reynolds series stress. <laughs> so I have um, also a good correlation between the, Renault, the importance and the Reynolds series stress, as in the DNS. And when I look on the right panel now, the importance per unit surface as a function of the, the Reynolds series stress per unit surface, we again find the three regions, right? In region A, the correlation is gone. In region B, we have the structures with the highest Reynolds shear stress. In region C, we have the structures with the highest importance. Now, you see actually something pretty cool, because like in the DNS, the most important things are not the ones with the highest Reynolds shear stress. In fact, in region C, you can see uh, two events with very, very low Reynolds shear stress and very, very high importance. So the classical intuition, the classical knowledge is perhaps not fully uh, correct. No, in this regard, just because um, it doesn't need to be that, uh, because we think that Reynolds shear stresses are important, they, they, they are the most important. Now, wouldn't it be interesting to uh, look at importance point by point and then try to uh, really look at the regions of highest importance to try to assess new coherent structures? Well, that's exactly what we did. So looking at the um, experimental data from Ivan Marusik, the, the 2D uh, planes, we use a variant of SHAP called gradient SHAP, uh, which is more computationally efficient that allowed us to do this for each uh, grid point. Um, the gradient SHAP gives us an importance for each of the fluctuations. So basically we can define a, a percolation analysis similar to the one that we did for the Reynolds shear stress. Um, and basically select the regions of highest SHAP, highest importance and define structures based on those. What I'm showing you at the bottom is um, in black, the Q events, so the classical structures, and in green, the sharp structures, the new ones. And you can see about 70% overlap, which is kind of interesting, right? It's reassuring in the sense that uh, obviously the Q events are important because they contain strong fluctuations, but they don't tell you the whole story. They're only part of the story. The most important regions are something else. They're not just Q events. In fact, if we do this analysis in 3D, the agreement between the Q events and the, and the sharp structures goes down to only 30%. So something that uh, one, we need to keep in mind. What I'm showing you now is the analysis in 3D for the DNS data. And these are very, very fresh results. So we're still analyzing them and, and expanding them. But uh, essentially what I'm showing you in the vertical axis is the wall normal coordinate, in the horizontal axis, the stringwise velocity fluctuations, and these are uh, joint PDF maps, right? So basically, where does the uh, probability density reside when I'm looking at the strong relative fluctuations and different uh, regions of the channel? And the first panel is the SHAP. The second one is the Q events, then the streaks, and then in the last row, uh, the vortex clusters, the vortices, with two different uh, criteria, which basically give us the same, okay? So that's interesting. I mean, now, again, we are looking at three-dimensional regions of importance. Those are our coherent structures. If we look at this in more detail and we compare, now in big, I'm showing you the sharp distribution of probability. Uh, and on the right, in blue, the Q events, in green, the streaks, in red, the vortices. Now, if we look at the sharp, we have this blue region over here, which corresponds to ejections. This blue region over here, which corresponds to sweeps. That's interesting. But also this green region here corresponds to low speed streaks, 
this uh, green region over here corresponds to high speed streaks. And there is even a region here with set of seed of fluctuations, which agrees quite well with the vortex clusters. So when you define importance point by point without any um, hypothesis, without any preconceived idea, the most important regions, the most important structures are actually in some places two events, in some places streaks, and in some places vortices. So all these classical structures that people have been looking at, um, they were not really wrong. I mean, they were obviously important, but they would not tell you the whole picture. The whole picture is taken when you put all these structures together and their relative importance is in different regions of the tree. Okay? And this is super important, not only to understand better turbulence, but to control it and to try to really uh, well, reduce drag and, and, and really control the flow in a way that is efficient. So this is exciting. And the last part of my talk has to do with uh, uh, with uh, control. And for uh, the control part, we're going to be using deep reinforcement learning. So in deep reinforcement learning, we have an agent which interacts with an environment. And the environment, in our case, will be as a simulation of our flow. That interaction is through actions. And those actions are basically the, the flow control that we want to apply on the flow. Uh, those actions will change the state of the flow and they will also change uh, the, the reward. And the reward is a measure of the quality of those actions under a certain norm, like drag reduction. Now, the, the goal is to define a policy pi, which given the state of the flow, gives us the um, best actions to take in order to maximize the reward. Mm -hmm. And this is work uh, in the channel, turbulent channel by Luca Guastoni, who was a postdoc and a PhD student in my group. So you can find the reference here with all the um, codes and all the data. And if you want a detailed review on reinforcement learning for flow control, there is this article in Physics of Fluids where we really went through all the methods, all the potential, and all the possibilities. So we consider a turbulent minimal channel uh, at Arita 180, and also a full channel at Arita 180, as our case, basically. And we want to compare with opposition control. In opposition control, what you have is um, you have the uh, in the near world region but with some sensing plane, uh, you want to really uh, sense the fluctuations, the volume of fluctuations. And then what you want to do is um, what you want to do is uh, impose at the wall the opposite fluctuations. Okay? So, so you really want to, in a way that is relatively simple, uh, inhibit the presence of those fluctuations through opposing them. Yeah, and, and, and it works with the water normal velocity. Um, the, the results are actually pretty good, especially at low Reynolds numbers, and this is going to be our baseline. In our approach, we're going to be using multi-agent reinforcement learning, and this is uh, also documented in this article in Nature, Reduce Physics, where we have uh, different regions of my wall. In these different regions, uh, I'm going to have uh, one or more actuators, in this case, one actuator, um, and the idea, the state will be the stream-wise and wall normal fluctuations at y plus 15. The reward is the wall shear stress reduction. And all these uh, different seed environments share the same parameters, right? So we have, uh, in a way, a mechanism for this uh, agent to be trained in parallel many times. And because there is a certain com connection of the, uh, of the rewards between the different seed environments, we can actually uh, have some sort of cooperation between these uh, between these agents, actually. And of course, the actions are going to be the wall normal velocity that we want to impose at the wall uh, through blowing and suction. Okay. Some results in the uh, minimal channel, uh, we get a 43% drag reduction with reinforcement learning, whereas only 26% with opposition control. So we actually outperform significantly the opposition control. If we take the same policy train in the minimal channel and deploy it in the full channel, uh, we still have much better results with, with deep reinforcement learning. So we get 30% drag reduction with reinforcement learning, only 20% with opposition control. And you can see here by looking at the joint PDFs that there is a significant impact of the control uh, on the flow. The vertical axis is the wall normal fluctuation at y plus 15. The horizontal axis is the streamless fluctuation at y plus 15. In the first panel, I'm showing you the joint PDF for both. Uh, so in turbulence, the Q2 and Q2 events are dominant as we saw in the second part of the talk. So the top left and bottom right panels are dominant. Uh, if we apply opposition control, the joint PDS, PDF gets a bit shrunk, but it's not really changing so much. If we apply DRL in the last panel, 
you can see a fundamental change in the distribution. So now there is a quite even distribution across fluctuations, which means that the flow is uh, significantly, significantly affected. So there is a lot of um, physics to be learned uh, by using reinforcement learning uh, to really control and understand these flow fields. You can see here that the amount of actuation from the opposition control it gets progressively lower as the flow gets more and more controlled. And in the bottom panel, I'm showing you uh, the actuation from the reinforcement learning, which is in practice some sort of bank bank control or two step control, which is interesting because this is a quite common strategy found in many areas like drone control and in many other robotics, uh, which in this particular case of the turbulent channel turns out to be a quite effective uh, control strategy as well. And these are some examples of um, DRL for flow control in a number of configurations. Now we are doing it in uh, turbulent separation bubbles at very high range numbers, uh, three dimensional cylinders, relevant air convection. In all these cases, we are fundamentally affecting the uh, characteristics of the flow. So we are really uh, able to, to have a big impact uh, on the, um, the physics in order to devise novel control strategies that were completely unexpected uh, before. So we're really scaling up uh, to progressively more and more challenging flow cases uh, for flow control. Three take-home messages. We are um, able to uh, perform DNS for quite complex aeronautical flows now. Uh, our main code um, is called SOF and that's developed together with the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, that's Priolem Cools uh, Group. So many of these reinforcement learning applications that you can see here uh, are with this, uh, with this very nice spectral learning code, which runs on GPUs uh, very efficiently. Uh, the SHAP method is allowing us to identify um, regions of importance in turbulence and to obtain very deep fundamental knowledge of turbulence. And then finally, deep reinforcement learning is really helping us to obtain completely novel and uh, unexpected uh, flow control strategies. Um, all the data and all the report, all the codes are available in this repository. So just access this QR code and you can get everything. If you want more information, uh, I have a series of uh, lectures in YouTube, so you can find all the material there and also in my social media if you want to discuss. I'm always happy to uh, collaborate and talk and, and brainstorm new ideas. So that's all that I have to, for today, and I will be happy to take uh, your questions. <laughs>